Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their careers and lives. I'm your host, Matt Picardle, and in this episode, I'll be sharing my experience of attending the 2022 SEAC convention or the Structural Engineers Association of California convention. Uh, there were a lot of great speakers and I want to share with you the lessons I learned attending and how attending conferences can help you and your career and how to get the most out of your time there. Now let's jump into our conversation of the week. This episode of the Structural Engineering Channel is brought to you by PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the PE Structural Exam. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the PE Structural Exam the first time. PPI's PE Structural course is fully updated and taught with October 2021 code references and includes new editions of their PE Structural books. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. When you take a live online course, PPI guarantees you will pass or you can take the on-demand course for free. PPI has helped engineers achieve their licensing goals since 1975. Check out PPI today at ppi2pass.com to see all of the resources available for PE structural exam prep. Again, that's ppi2pass.com. Hey, I'm Matt Picardle. I'm a structural engineer in the Southern California area, and I work mainly on buildings and a lot of uh, seismic design. And yeah, that's one of the reasons I decided to attend uh, the SEAC conference. Uh, Some other reasons were uh, particularly to bring things back to my office, things that I learned technically, but also uh, professional development wise, maybe communication uh, soft skill wise, because I'm also a project manager. And some other reasons were, uh, it's fun going to these things. I mean, it's not just all technical sessions. There's other events like the social events that we can go to where you get to network and and talk to maybe some of your old colleagues, but also talking to new engineers, because that's really cool, too. You get to see what uh, structural engineering really is and all the different career paths that that go into it. Uh, so that's always uh, interesting to learn about. And today, I just want to go over some of the topics that I learned about and some of the lessons learned technically and uh, professionally. And I also want to talk about why you should attend the conference and my advice when you actually go there, how to make the most out of your time there. All right, first up, let's talk about some of the technical things, the the code stuff, the seismic uh, changes and the building codes. So I think the the most straightforward thing is the ASCE 722, the changes that are going to those. I'm not going to go through each and all the equations, but I did write some notes down and kind of just giving you a big uh, overview. So for ASCE 722, uh, there's going to be a lot of tsunami changes or or I think more clear codes if they design, they require you to design for tsunami loads. The ASCE 722 is going to have more information on that and how you can calculate uh, those loads. Uh, Chapter seven in the AS 722, the snow loads, they're, they're, that's having a major revamp. So the way we do snow loads now, uh, you can expect that that's going to be updated. I think it's going to be more computerized. So it is for the better. And uh, looking forward to that if you deal with uh, snow a lot. And I've also wrote down for seismic, they're getting rid of the mass irregularity. Uh, so that's going to, to get out of there. And they're also going to have some more diaphragm design. Uh, I think they're going to have more options on how to do diaphragm designs. And also they're getting rid of some other stuff like, uh, was it chapter 12.6? I, I forget the table, but it had something to do with the, the ELF procedure. It was that table that had all of the permitted. And then you had one section that says, uh, this is when you can do ELF. So apparently they're taking that out because they're saying, Uh, The ELF procedure, you know, it's conservative. So you should be able to use it if you meet all of the updated criteria. 
uh, non-structural components equation. They are updating that equation. It's still the same thing, but they got some new parameters, updated parameters uh, as well. And wind, they're making that a little bit easier too. They're getting rid of some of the, the tables. So instead of having like five different ways to do it, maybe you might have three now. So I, I think that's great work that that committee's doing. And it seems like they are making the code uh, more updated, more easier to use, which I really appreciate, especially when uh, we can use computers and maps and things like that. And there are a lot of topics with uh, concrete shear walls because in California, ACI 3, uh, the upcoming ACI 3, 14, 19, they're going to be having uh, bigger shear walls, essentially. Uh, not on all cases, but in some cases, you could be experiencing uh, increased thicknesses of uh, shear walls. So there was a lot of uh, new detailing requirements as well. So there was a lot of uh, seminars on that. So that was really interesting, all the detailing requirements that, uh, that, that go into it now. And now I want to dive into some of the professional development seminars that I attended. I took a mix of both the technical stuff, but also some professional development things because I'm a manager and I need to develop those managerial soft skills, uh, communication skills. So I attended some of those too that that were really helpful. I think one of the ones that were most memorable to me was the how to give technical presentations, particularly in this uh, digital world where we're doing a lot of meetings. You know, you've been in those meetings where everyone has their camera turns off and it's very uh, disengaging. And when you're giving technical presentations like that, I mean, that's the whole point of giving a presentation is for people to be engaged and to listen to your to your content. So I think one of the most important things that I learned about, about that was, uh, first of all, give presentations because whether you know it or not, you're an expert at something. If you, what defines an expert is basically, you know, you don't need to be like the best of the best. It's, you can be a new engineer and maybe one year of experience, but you're an expert in terms of maybe the intern. You're going to be helping the intern and you can talk about things that that new intern isn't going to have. So being afraid to give uh, presentations because you think you're not an expert in anything, I don't necessarily think that's, that's true because you have value and you can present that value. Uh, it just needs to be towards the right audience. Uh, particularly with the younger engineers, you know, technology that can apply to almost everybody because not everyone's caught up with the the technology na nowadays. And I think one of the most important things in that seminar as well was to not have a boring presentation. Uh, you can have really good content, but if you deliver it in a way that is very disengaging and it's not relevant to the audience, that kind of defeats the whole purpose of coming up with the presentation. What's the point of you speaking if uh, no one's going to listen or take value from your presentation? Another good professional development seminar that I attended was how to design effective meetings. So this one was uh, really cool because they gave us uh, meeting templates and some of the mistakes that I was doing when I was running meetings is like, I was doing everything. I was, uh, for some meetings, I would uh, be the one leading the meeting, but I would also be the one uh, writing the minutes. And then I would also be the moderator. So doing three roles, it's a lot better to split up those roles so you're not overwhelmed, but also the meeting can run a lot more effectively because everyone has essentially one job to do during that meeting. And I think that was really a, a good one because that's something that uh, you know I'm implementing right now at work and, and any other professional organizations. So that one was really practical. And the last professional development seminar that I attended was the, it was a networking one, which was a, a really cool because, I mean, I, I went there to network, but when I went there, I did, was not good at networking. So attending that, the actually, that was really cool because it was interactive and it kind of changed your mindset about networking. And it's a lot easier than you think, especially uh, with engineers uh, that's are going through the same thing and that are in the same industry. Uh, for me, one of the things that I took out of it was, you know, come prepared for networking events. Uh, I did this subconsciously, but when I went to the conference, you know, I would keep asking the same questions to anyone that was new. It was essentially, 
oh, hey, I'm Matt. I work at XYZ company. And uh, what company do you work for? So that was like my first, what do you call it, in your pocket or default uh, go-to questions. And the other one was, oh, where, what type of work do you do? Uh, that's one's really easy. So they can either be a student or they can be a working professional and they can just tell you about all the types of projects and what's your favorite project and how are you liking the convention so far? So having those backup questions that go to, if I don't have any good ones, that made it a lot easier because now it's kind of just a flow chart, like an engineering thing. Okay, ask this question and then you go to the next one if that doesn't work. So, but it's easy, especially with structural engineers. Uh, we all have different types of projects and similar experiences. So it was really easy to connect and just having some type of outline and being prepared for networking events. I think that was really a, uh, uh, valuable. And the last topic that I wanted to bring up, not necessarily a topic, but if you're a younger member or a, a, a structural engineering student, they had their SE Pathways cohort. That one was really cool. I didn't attend because I'm not that young anymore, but uh, I did get to talk to a few students and a few younger members that were attending that. And I, that seemed really cool because they would attend a mix of both of those uh, professional development topics uh, technical topics, but also their own uh, conversations with people from the industry. And I think that was really cool because if you're a student or a younger member, you get a better sense of what the industry is really like by actually talking to real professionals. They had some good feedback on what the industry is going through with some of the challenges that we're going through as uh, the industry and some of the ways that we're improving it. And for the younger members, the students, I mean, they're the future. So preparing them for that, uh, I think is essential, but it also engages them in the structural engineering community because uh, before when they wouldn't have these, I remember when I was a student, you go to these conventions and it would just be a lot of technical things that as a student, you may have no idea. So it kind of disengages you as a student, but now you get to actually talk to uh, structural engineering professionals and even have mentorship sessions with them. I think that's very valuable because uh, for students, young professionals, I think that's really hard for them to, to do. I know it was for me. So getting that experience uh, right up front, I think is very valuable. So if you're a student or young professional, uh, there's, there's a good reason for you to attend these conventions as well. And throughout the convention, I know there were some topics that kind of kept coming up during some of the announcements and some of the sessions uh, with the younger members and also some professionals as well. I know for the younger members, there was a lot of talk about imposter syndrome. And, you know, when they, when they finally get the first job, they have no idea what they're doing. And it, that's kind of the way it is. It was refreshing to see that, uh, you know, of course, the uh, structural engineering professionals, we all went through this. Uh, we know our school systems, our curriculums aren't the best at preparing us for real world structural engineering. So it is something that we pretty much all essentially had to go through. And it's all right to feel that way. And it's you're always going to be feeling that way if you're, you know, you keep advancing your career. Uh, it was really interesting to see some of the structural engineering professionals that were in the industry for many years and that were veteran and there were past presidents and incoming presidents, you know, supporting the younger engineers uh, through that and helping them through that and how they got through it and how it's uh, perfectly okay. I think that's, I think that helped them out a lot because you're still going to be going through that even when you're a veteran. Uh, just like they said, it's, you know, they've done a lot of things and even though they've been in the profession for 30 plus years, there's always new things that they don't know about and you always feel like you're not ready for them. Uh, but that's how you grow as a person and as a professional. Uh, some other things too. Uh, I think one of the topics was what happens if you want to, have you ever thought about leaving the structural engineering industry? And that topic has, has uh, come up in some of the surveys um, and like work-life balance. So topics like that, that were very interesting to, to hear and and talk to people about because different engineers go through it in different ways, uh, going, trying to see what their journey was like and trying to figure out what they were good at. And I think one of the things that uh, helped them out was going to professional or professional organizations like this conventions like this, 
because that that is where you're going to find like-minded individuals and uh, they can help you out on what they did. How did they get through that process of what's next for my career or what's my career path looking like? Uh, what if I move to the construction industry or a different type of industry? What does that look like? What things did other people uh, think about? And uh, talking to other professionals, I think that can lead you in the right direction, or at least have you think about the questions that are are really important and things to think about when you're making these uh, big decisions. Uh, but it was really inspiring to see that, you know, yeah, people and structural engineers have thought about it, but going to things like this, I know for me, when I thought about it, it was you know, going to professional organizations like this, seeing the energy from the young engineers and seeing the enthusiasm from the older generation as well and and their willingness to help out uh, engineers and uh, seeing how cool our profession is by, you know, keeping the public safe. Our, our profession is really important. We have really important jobs. We may not be the most uh, celebrated, but I think we can take pride in what we do, even though it's hard work, but it's really fulfilling work. I think that's one of the main things that separates our industry from uh, other industries. Our work is so fulfilling if you get you know, fulfilled seeing your building built, seeing it designed and from the ground up, from a piece of paper to something tangible for the next 50 years. Uh, for me, that's one of the, the most fulfilling feelings that I can get. And it's going to be tough to find another profession that does that. Maybe maybe construction, maybe building it is going to be uh, equally as good. Uh, but for my advice, when you actually go to these uh, conventions is to be prepared. Uh, for me, having that set of questions, those your default questions, because you're going to be meeting a, a lot of uh, new people, and you get to learn about a lot of uh, different projects and things that they do. So having those backup questions can really help you out uh, in terms of networking. Uh, but they usually also give you a program where you can actually plan out your, your session selections. Obviously, you can figure out which technical sessions are good for you and, and the work that you do as a structural engineer. But I also encourage you to, you know, go to the professional, some of the professional development uh, seminars, because I believe those are the skills that us as engineers need to develop more. We're, you know, in terms of uh, technical skills, we're really good. And in terms of soft skills, maybe communication skills, we're you know, we don't want to put too much effort in there, but it goes a long way. Uh, a little bit of effort goes a long way because we're we're not the best, not all of us, at least in terms of communication and soft skills. So attending those can definitely help improve those skills, uh, but also attend the the social events too. I think those were really fun. Uh, some of the dinners that we went to, uh, it was cool to see a lot of engineers dancing. I've never seen so many structural engineers on uh, the dance floor. So that was uh, really fun. And also, you know, uh, meeting some of my old colleagues too, that was uh, also good and, and going to the lunch events. So don't skip out on those. It's, uh, it's, it's a good experience and you'll meet a lot of, uh, new people, friendly people, and, uh, some of the best people in the structural engineering industry. Uh, so Hopefully I'll see you at the next one. And yeah, thanks for tuning in and and, uh, and watching or listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode today. We'd love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, which is episode number 87, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Until next time, we wish you the best in all of your structural engineering endeavors.